So here we have um, a very good map, very good black and white map of World War One in East Africa. I'm not going to go through this in any great detail at all. Uh, now, if I can remember how to do this, there we go. There's the red dot. If you look to the left of your screen, there's Lake Tanganyika. Uh, the Germans at this stage are occupying German East Africa, which becomes Tang Tanganyika. The British to the north have British East Africa, which becomes Kenya, then gets renamed Kenya at independence. Um, to the west are the Belgians in the Congo. Uh, they will feature. Um, to the very south, Portuguese East Africa, which later becomes um, Zimbabwe. Um, and then, oh, 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 no, I'm getting my countries wrong there. <laughs> anyway, no matter. And then uh, the British are bottom left there in Ro Rhodesia, which then that becomes Zimbabwe. So the Germans are effectively surrounded. But at the beginning of this story, they have control of Lake Tanganyika. But I want to give you a bit of background. Before I leave this map, you'll notice that the Germans have got a very, very good railway. So starting in Dar es Salaam on the, on the coast, there's a very good port, Dar es Salaam. And then there's this railway, which comes all the way through, kind of heading pretty much due west to Tabora. Now missing on the map, and I've added it in in red, there's a little railway line that goes all the way through to, to Kigoma. So it's important that you know that the Germans can get to that lake by rail because that's how they put their third ship onto the lake the great war in africa uh, this is a map that i i would like to understand a lot better i've got several books to read um but just very simply uh these are the kind of movements around tanzania the the germans are nip into into um kenya or east british east africa as it was then and disrupt railway lines um but they've they've got control. What we're talking about today is particularly that they have control of Lake Tanganyika. Now it's very handy to have control of a lake in the middle of Africa in 1914, um, because it's 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 like a kind of super highway. Basically, if you've got um, somewhere where you can land uh, troops, you can, you can put troops on a ship. You can then take them anywhere on the lake. You can attack one place in the north one day and then the next day attack in the south is very very handy um and the the belgians uh don't have anything on the lake to match what the germans have we'll, we'll go into that um on the east side of east africa uh the germans are having a field day with their commerce raider um so this is in indian ocean the uh the German ship, the Königsberg, which um, is a, a, a fast ship. I think it's probably a cruiser. I, I don't fully understand battleships. Um, but you can see its armament there. Uh, ten big guns, ten little guns, and, and a couple of small, small gun, a couple of torpedo tubes as well. Um, this is, is running around and it's causing havoc. The Royal Navy are very hacked off because they're losing shipping to the Königsberg. Now, eventually, the Königsberg gets uh, gets cornered, and the Royal Navy get it, force it up the Rufiki Delta, um, where it 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 is then um, attacked. They use a couple of aeroplanes spotting and a couple of um, little little ships with mortars on. So the fire is being directed by aeroplanes, and they eventually. Um, damaged the Königsberg so much that it is, that it's scuttled and it, it it can't can't be made to float again. The the Germans are controlling it. Um, Britain and Belgium have co well, coastlines have um, land uh, adjacent to the to the the lake, and the the Belgians and the British would like to control the lake, but the Germans have got uh, have got uh, a, a good strong presence there. Now, they've got two little gunboats on, on the lake. The 100-ton Hedwig von Wismann, uh, which is a fairly sizable thing, and then a small thing called the, the Kingani, which is 45 tons. Uh, and we will we'll learn more about those very soon. They also have 
um, an additional that they've got a very big ship that they're going to bring onto the lake, the 800 ton Graf von Goetzen. Now, the Germans were very clever here. They they'd thought ahead, they recognized that they wanted a stronger presence on the lake. So they commissioned a German shipyard to construct this, this ship, the Graf von Goetzen. They're to, they're to construct it in the German sh shipyard with a view to immediately deconstructing it and putting it into packing cases because it's then going to get shipped to Dar es Salaam. But it gets shipped in three ships altogether, offloaded, put on the railway, and then taken to Kigani and reconstructed. Now, the British didn't know about the Graf von Goetzen when, the, when they got started. Um, the rest of that page there, I, I won't go into the detail, basically shows that the, the Germans had um, knocked the Belgians out of out of the fighting on the lake um, by basically destroying whatever the, the Belgians had. This is the, the little German ship, the King Garni. Um, but this is a later photograph because you see it's flying a British flag. Uh, so, you know, spoiler alert, it gets captured. So, here's, here's our story. Um, so, what's going to happen is the Royal Navy are going to commission two river launches, uh, which get the names Mimi and Tutu, and they're brought overland. You can see here dot 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 they're landed in south africa and then there's this route through africa to get them onto the lake uh, and that's the 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 main plot of the story which which i find very enjoyable very entertaining and here here is our man here is the great hero of the piece um captain Sp jeffrey basil spicer simpson who's a bit of a character he's he's a hero but he's, he's certainly a flawed hero. Um, to call him eccentric is um, is just a start. Let's let's learn a bit more about him. So he originally comes from Tasmania, joins the Royal, Royal Navy eighteen ninety. Um, he starts off fairly well. Um, so he's good at surveying. He's good at, at drawing maps of um, oceans and navigable rivers. It's very valuable skill to have for the Royal Navy, uh, serves in North Borneo and so on. But then his his career in actually commanding ships is not brilliant. In 1902, he's posted to a Royal Navy destroyer, um, which collides with a Liberty boat. Um, so he was the captain, he, so he takes responsibility, and they think, well, we're, we're not going to trust him with another ship quite yet. So he, he gets a shore posting at that point 1914 they gave him command of a contraband control vessel and um, he'd only had it for two weeks uh, this is late in 1914 um, so there, there is his ship HMS Niger um, it was it was in port uh, he was actually off the ship he was in the hotel looking out of the window and it was torpedoed in broad daylight um, so the Admiralty were, were very displeased with him and thought uh, that this guy, he's, he's got certain skills. He, he's quite a quite a capable bloke, a very bright bloke, but he's not necessarily very good at being captain of a ship. So we'll give him a desk job. Uh, so he's posted to the Admiralty, uh, working with uh, merchant ships in the Admiralty. Now, my summary of his personality um, eccentric. I could have underlined that. Um, he was very full of himself. He told exaggerated tales of his own bravery and accomplishments. Uh, he didn't want anyone else to get credit when he could claim credit. So uh, our man, John Lee, who thought up this idea, who then goes and prepares the route, um, he gets he gets sidelined by Spicer Simpson. Another little eccentricity, eccentricity of his is his body was covered in tattoos of butterflies and snakes, um, and that the local people in Africa were were highly fascinated by this. He, he, he would actually um, have, have a bath in the open air, and they would watch him have a bath and, and watch him ripple his muscles and so on. He, he also, when he was in the centre of Africa, he went a bit native and wore a skirt because he found it more comfortable. Now, um, the Admiralty um, acquired these two um, 
river launches. I'll show you a photograph in the moment. And they said to Simpson, oh, oh so, sorry, so, so Simpson's in the Admiralty. Lee goes and, and gives his story. Um, Sim, nobody wants to volunteer, but Simpson overhears about this and he thinks, here's an opportunity, here's, here's a, a, an interesting adventure. So he volunteers, so that's how he gets the job. So, so I should have said that bit before. Um, and he wants to, the Navy say, well, you're in command of this. You can choose the names of these two river launches. So he says, right, okay, I'd like to call them Cat and Dog. And the Royal Navy say, you can't call naval vessels Cat and Dog. No, you're a thing. You're not calling them Cat and Dog. So he says, well, all right. And so he goes away and thinks about it. He says, how about calling them Mimi and Tutu? Oh, yeah, that's fine. You can call them Mimi and Tutu. Now, if, you, if you're good at French, you'll know this translates as Meow and Bow Wow. So... There you go. You call them that. You can't call them cat and dog. Uh, and there we have um, <laughs> Mimi in the foreground and Tutu in the background. They are motor launches uh, and they are commissioned and uh, from the, the Thornycroft shipyard. Uh, and here they are in trials uh, on the River Thames. Uh, so what they've done is they've added armaments to the guns. So you can see there the, the quick firing gun at the front and the machine gun at the back. It's intriguing. In the books, they talk, call it a Maxim gun, but I, I don't think it's a Vickers, but anyway, no matter. Um, that is what a Royal Navy quick, power, quick firing three pounder gun looks like. So on a small ship, this is a very handy bit of, uh, bit of weaponry. So the idea is that these are going to be commissioned, they're going to be set up, and then they're going to be packed for transport by ship and then by rail and this is this is this wonderful story that i'm going to share with you it's quite uh, quite something so uh, this is the route this is thought up by by john lee uh, and i'll just kind of go through it um with particular emphasis on the on the, the trickiest bit so england to cape town by ship that's fairly straightforward that's over six thousand miles Cape Town to Elizabeth by rail, that's nearly 2,000 miles. Then there's a smaller railway line that isn't as solid, uh, 140 miles, Elizabethville to F Fungurumi. Now then, the, this is the trickiest bit here. I'm, there we go, I've got the, the, the red marker here. Fungurumi to Sanskiskia overland. So they're using, they're, they're pulling vehicles, pulling carts by oxen. Uh, there's a lot of African porters. There's, there's thousands of Africans involved and traction engines. They have to go 120 miles, which includes actually going over a mountain range. This is extraordinary stuff. Uh, then at the other end of that, um, there's a 15 mile rail journey. Then the Lula Baba River. Well, you'd think a motor launch would be all right on a river. Well, it's it's not. It's a bit tricky, but we'll come to that. Then the final 175 miles are by rail. So they've come to South Africa. They've come up the railway line. Here's my red. So they come through Rhodesia. They've got to Fungarumi in the Belgian Congo. This is the trickiest bit, the, the overland bit to San Skissia. Um, that, that's really hard going. That's, that's a story in itself. Then uh, a bit more railway. Then along the Lulambarba River. And then there's this short trip by rail to get them onto the lake. Um, Imperial War Museum have a small number of wonderful photographs. So, so there we see um, one of the, uh, the the launches on a railway carriage with the, with the chap sitting there, and what a lot of stores because the, the bases have got to keep, keep, take everything with them, um, and then somehow manage to be self sufficient. However long this is going to take, a uh, very large number of natives pressed into service. Um, and uh, here we have part of the overland trek. Uh, Spicer Simpson himself was often on his bicycle going ahead um, to check the route. Now, this route, this the, this route had been cleared by John Lee in advance. Um, so they had an idea of, of where they were going and a route had been cleared. But it, it was quite tricky. Um, there's uh, a whole load of difficult terrain. There's uh, water courses to, to be 
traversed and so on. And we see here one way of, of getting through a watercourse. Uh, what a huge amount of timber uh, has been involved. We're laying, uh, laying, laying the trunks, um, as it were, to make, a, I think it's called a corrugated road. Uh, so there's a huge amount of, of human effort. Now, um, this is a, a photograph I found on a, on a website. I think it's just worth reading a little bit of this to kind of catch some of the, the detail of what happens. Uh, difficult conditions, high temperatures. The soil has a lot of mica in it, so it's actually very strongly reflective. So they have effectively snow, snow blindness um, in sunshine. Unexpected swamps and forest fires. Um, there's animal holes uh, appear in this newly made road. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, Spice Simpson goes ahead on his on his bike. Um, and uh, two weeks in, and with 30 miles to go, the trailers that have been made to carry the motor launches uh, collapsed and were seen to be unrepairable. So what they had to do was then take the trailers that they'd used for the wood supply for the locomotive and convert those to carry the launches instead. That was a five-day delay. Um, the muddy season was approaching and they'd still got to cross the mountains. So... Um, the expedition continues. They somehow they get up a mountain at this in the, this stage in this photograph. The traction engines can't pull uh, firmly enough, so they they're using a block and tackle tackle um, and oxen. You can see there to to actually pull the uh, the motor launches through. And there's that that map again. They eventually get you use the red dot. They've got over over the overland bit. There's now the railway, and then there's going to be the river Lualaba, let's say it properly. Um, and there's a photograph of one of the, the launches in the Lualaba. Uh, and it's not a terribly deep river, and there's sandbanks, and that's problematic as well. However, eventually they make it to the next bit of railway, and they get to the, um, uh, the, they get to the Lake Tanganyika. So... Uh, what happens is that, that the British make camp, they conceal their ships, and um, the Germans are kind of hearing that something's happening, um, that the local the, the local peoples are the hollow, hollow people. Um, and uh, it's actually just over the Christmas period, 26th of December, the Kingani uh, has come around the, the lake, um, and... Um, so what what happens is the 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 Kingani comes now. The Kingani is going to be coming this way here. Mimi and Tutu are launched, and they get behind it. And you can see from here that um, the Kingani is is trying to head in a northeasterly direction. Mimi and Tutu are behind and firing their guns, and uh, they do a fair bit of de well, they do a bit of damage to the Kingani, such that it has to stop and it is captured uh, and the British are rather pleased and they they get possession of this uh, little boat, this little ship uh, and they call it HMS Fifi. So we've got Mimi, Tutu and Fifi, wonderful names. Uh, and there's a, a period photograph uh, of, um, of, I think that's Fifi there. Now, Spicer Simpson, what, what a, what a rather odd gentleman. Uh, there he is on the left. Uh, there's Spicer Simpson wearing his skirt. He was more comfortable in a skirt. That's fine. Um, and on board um, the um, on on board the ship, the, the, the Fifi, there's the little goat there on the right-hand side. So maybe the Germans had it along as a bit of a mascot or, or maybe it was going to be dinner in a few, few days' time. Um, but the... He's adopted by the British. We do we do like our animals, don't we? Um, so what happens next? Um, well, at this point, the the local people are hugely impressed with Spicer Simpson. They they think maybe he's some some kind of god character, and little clay statues of him begin to appear around the area. Um, they didn't care for the Germans, so so here's a a, a British 
gentleman, a British admiral, who appears to be working magic, and so he, he gains great status amongst the hollow, hollow people. Um, that image there is is uh, an example of um, of hollow, hollow um, artifact. Now, the next boat that they need to deal with um, is uh, a, a slower moving thing. It's a lot bigger. So it's the Hedvig von Wismann. It's a converted vessel again. 120 feet long, 57 tons. It can only go six or seven knots. So Mimi and Tutu are somewhat faster. It's got more guns. It's got three one and a half inch Hotchkiss, a revolving cannon and two additional cannons. This eventually comes out onto the lake. Mimi, Tutu with um, Fifi following behind, managed to um, catch up with the Hedwig von Wismann put a good few artillery shells through it and sink it. So so that's gone. So now Mimi, Tutu and Fifi, as it were, have possession of the lake. So they think, however, um the the British now to their distress discover that there's yet another vessel on the lake. They didn't know about this. This is the Graf von Goetz and this is the the, the ship that the Germans had commissioned in Germany and had sent packaged up in boxes and then reconstructed at the shoreline of um, of Lake Tanganyika. And the Graf von Gertsen is a substantial ship. So uh, 1,200 tonnes, it can go eight to eight, eight to nine knots. So it's not that fast, but it's got a four-inch gun, a three-inch gun, two one-and-a-half-inch hostages, and a revolving cannon. Now, I'm afraid... Um, at this point, Spicer Simpson has done very, very well. He's been recognised. The Admiralty are very pleased with him because, of course, they're in wireless contact with the Admiralty. Um, but now he his um, his courage begins to wane. He, he realises just how dangerous this thing is, and he chooses not to go out and fight it. He is he, making excuses. Um, the biggest gun on the, the Graf von Goetzen had been salvaged from the uh, the Königsberg that we, we saw earlier in the talk. So um, there's uh, a big gun, which uh, Spicer Simpson is wary of, and he basically just simply avoids it. Um, now, the Belgians bring in some aeroplanes. Uh, they're using, um, using planes for bombing raids, and they're attacking the harbour of Kigoma. Now, they don't actually damage the the, the, the von Goetzen, but the Germans have decided that they don't want to risk this ship um, going out onto the lake again. They strip the guns from her because they could be used elsewhere. And they, they actually um, prepared the, the the ship so it could be could be salvaged in the future. And they... Uh, they scuttled the ship. So Leto Furbeck ordered that the, the Gertsen was scuttled. The Graf von Gertsen um, had been scuttled uh, and um, the, uh, the the ship was actually raised again. Um, the the ship could be reused. The, the engines and the boilers were still usable, rehabilitated. And come 1927, the ship went back into service under the, the name merchant vessel Liemba. And coming back to, to the book um, with Giles Foden, Giles Foden actually went out to Africa um, and travelled on the Liemba. He said it wasn't terribly comfortable. Um, now, if all this sounds vaguely familiar, you might be thinking of the film The African Queen, which in some ways is based on this story. Uh, it's a while since I've seen the film. Um, but it... It roughly has the idea that uh, there's uh, a couple of British or, or even American um, heroes who uh, wish to destroy a big German ship and they're prepared to fill their ship full of explosives uh, to sail it in. And that's that's the African Queen. And um, if you've if you've seen it, you'll, you'll know how that ends that by accident. Um, the uh, the African Queen floats into the the ship, which is really meant to be the Graf von Goetzen, and and explodes. 